going on, guys? This is our first show in a while. It's good to be back, and I'm so excited to be back with one of my favorite segments here at Screen Junkies, Movie Science, with one of my favorite human beings, the kind, generous, and learned Dr. Clifford V. Johnson. Dr. Johnson, great to have you back. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course. Uh, you always come in and class up the joint. First off, I want to uh, ask you about, you have a book that you've written? Uh, not just written, I've been drawing it as well. It's what? actually been a, 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 a labor of love for many years. It's a graphic book. It's a non-fiction book about science, but it's a graphic book. It's like a graphic novel that's making science more accessible? Yeah, it's called The Dialogues, Conversations About the Nature of the Universe. Ah, tremendous. Not only are you a professor at USC, uh, a published author, but you also are a science advisor on movies and TV shows, including the awesome Thor Ragnarok. Yeah. Wow. Let's jump into it. So one of the coolest parts of Asgard and, and uh, the world that they've established is the Bifrost, how they travel to different worlds, different realms. What's the Bifrost? Like literally in scientific terms, is it a wormhole? What, what is it? Well, I think you're on the right track there. It's okay. clearly some sort of device that allows you to move extraordinary distances through the universe uh, in a very short amount of time. The longest escalator in the universe? The longest, but also the shortest because it does it really quickly. So is it like closer to a wormhole or is it closer to like getting beamed up in Star Trek? That's a good question. My rationalization of it is that it is wormhole-like, mm -hmm. um, but it has some properties of something like a transporter. You still sort of see that beam that comes down, as it yeah. were. But where's it coming down from? Is it really stretching across space and time like that? No, I actually think it, it, it is going through some sort of tunnel, which a wormhole is. Thor Ragnarok taught me a very interesting term. Doctor, I would like to ask you about the devil's anus. Ah. Yes. What is the devil's anus? As far as I gather from what's going on on that planet, they've used it as a, as a, as a friendly term gotcha. for what seems to be one of the largest and most violent wormhole entrances uh, hovering just above the surface of the planet. How is the Devil's Anus formed? You're not given any detail in the film as to how things came that way, that you have this planet and there's lots of entrances of wormholes and stuff's falling out of them from elsewhere in the universe. It's some sort of nexus of stuff where lots of wormholes connect and that's okay. sort of interesting. And so... Oh, kind of uh, like a, a freeway interchange. Yeah, like a freeway interchange, but also it's also sort of a parking lot for a lot of stuff that comes out in a way. Um, Man, that sounds like terrible traffic. Uh, yes. It's not made clear whether that was a natural occurrence or whether that is something that some extraordinarily powerful being or uh, civilization has engineered. Um, so I think you get to decide which, uh, but it's certainly clear that there's, there's a lot of interesting opportunities for stuff to come through that may be interesting. Mm -hmm. And so it makes sense then to come and set up camp there and just, just exploit all that stuff that's falling in. And occasionally you get interesting creatures that can be your gladiators and things yeah. like that. Uh, what is a collapsing neutron star inside uh, an Einstein Rosen bridge? Well, an Einstein Rosen bridge is an example of a, a kind of wormhole mm -hmm. that connects two distant parts of, of space. It's okay. sort of like a shortcut. The old uh, analogy that's used, which you've seen in any number of films, is, is that, you know, you have a piece of paper and, you know, there's one bit of space, and another bit of space, and then you make a hole, you make a hole, and you fold it together, and now they're right next to each other, oh! and that's the wormhole. Whoa, how many times has that been used? Ice on Rosen Bridge. There are many other kinds of wormhole, but that's the one that has the most uh, famous play in popular culture sure. because Einstein is attached to the name. In the scenario that uh, is in the film, mm -hmm. is that the different kinds of wormhole that you see the ends of, the wormhole is connecting that end to some other end. So depending upon what's at the other end of the wormhole or in the interior of the wormhole, it has certain properties. Oh. And so I think what's going on in that particular one is that there's a neutron star, which is 
uh, a very active kind of star, probably rotating really fast, maybe very magnetic. Yes. So it has a lot of electromagnetic activity, which you're seeing the signs of uh, at the edge of that wormhole. Yeah. And so when our scientist, Dr. Bruce, Bruce Banner, Banner, looks at it, he recognizes that it's that kind of wormhole with that sort of activity. Who's smarter, Dr. Bruce Banner or Dr. Clifford V. Johnson? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, he's uh, probably had a much longer career in he science than I have. He has seven PhDs. Uh, he has seven PhDs, so we're done. He wins. In the movie, Surtur the demon had a giant sword that he was going to destroy Asgard with. Can you destroy a planet by stabbing it with a sword? Big enough sword. Describe the type of sword that um, one would need to destroy Earth. Well, actually, scenarios like that have happened to the Earth before. What? S stay with me. So, uh, like, a space creature attacked Earth with a, with a blunt um, object? It wasn't really a space creature, but in the early years of the formation of the solar system, when the Earth was still young, there's a lot of evidence that something did smash into the Earth, and a big chunk of it came off, and that's what the moon actually is. The moon was a piece of the Earth? Uh-huh. Due to a big thing smashing into the Earth and smashing a piece off. So it's a wow. little bit like your sword scenario. Yeah, like the a sword or like a hammer. Yeah. Thor's hammer brought it back around. Nicely done. Thor's hammer. He uses that thing like a helicopter. Yes. How does that work? I, I used to spin it really fast, and it, it, would, it would pull me off the ground, up into the air, and I would fly. Yeah, we don't really know what's in that hammer. I think it's more than just a piece of very dense material. Some of the heaviest matter that we know of in the universe comes from the core of dead stars. So, so I, I, I suggested oh. they, may, they may throw that in, and I, cool. and I think there's a line in there where, where indeed Thor mentions uh, um, that about the origin of the hammer. Quite unique, it was made from this, this special metal from the heart of a dying star. The hammer is supposed to be so heavy that like, if you get something that's that heavy and then you let go, could that pull you up? Mm, I think that's not going to work well if I think about it. Yeah, it's not going to work well. Because the mass and the force, yeah. those are terms. Seems great. Those I'm are using terms. terms. You've got some good terms there. Conservation of momentum is going to mess you up. Some means by which something goes in the opposite direction in order to propel him forwards. There's no uh, evidence that Thor um, is producing any exhaust as he flies. Depends on what uh, Thor ate for lunch. Exactly. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, right. So maybe he does. Maybe it's just not talked about. Wait, yeah, okay. As guardian manners. So you're saying it's possible that every time Thor spins his hammer and flies, he is releasing massive godlike farts. I'm, I said exhaust. Spoiler alert, Matt Damon had a cameo. I'm wondering if his character was actually his character from Interstellar <laughs> and he was flung into a black hole and somehow wound up on Asgard where in order to survive he had to become an actor in weird plays directed by Odin slash Loki. That's utterly brilliant. And you know, he can get around, he knows how to get around these various places because he's also the talented Mr. Ripley. All movies exist in the same reality. Right, and they all have Matt Damon in them in some way. So we're not just talking Thor, there was a lot of Hulk in the movie. Oh, there's a lot of Hulk. Yeah, Hulk got his powers from gamma radiation. If I got struck by gamma rays, in real life, what would happen to me? Probably, depending upon how much exposure you had, uh, yeah, not that. Um, green. You, you'd, probably, green. you'd probably get ill. These are high energy electromagnetic waves that when they hit the stuff that makes you up, the yeah. atoms and molecules, they tend to just damage them. I'd be sick, but what would happen, Dr. Clifford V. Johnson, if you made me angry? Well, I'd probably feel really bad that I made you angry because you were sick. So I wouldn't hulk out, I'd just be like sick and angry? You'd just be sick and angry. Getting hit by gamma rays would suck. Yeah. Oh! It came to me! There it is! Apparently I'm worthy enough to lift the hammer. Apparently you are. I knew you had it in you. Thanks, Doc. <laughs> Doctor, I want to thank you for coming in here and wielding a mighty hammer of knowledge. 
It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, always a pleasure. What are some of the movies that you want to see the science broken down for? Are there any other pressing MCU science questions you'd like us to pose to Dr. Clifford V. Johnson? Let us know in the comments section below. We want to know. I want to thank our good friend Dr. Clifford V. Johnson once again. Pick up his book, The Dialogues. And I want to thank you for watching Screen Junkies. I'm Hal Rudnick. Hit me up on Twitter. Bye-bye. <laughs>